President Trump brokers a diplomatic agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Israel is agreeing to abandon plans to annex parts of the West Bank in exchange for a return to normal relations with the UAE. President Trump's touting the accomplishment as a significant step toward encouraging other Arab and Muslim nations in the region to broker their own deals. Well, joining me now, the founder of the American Truth Project and Daily Ledger contributor, Barry Newsbaum. Barry, so can you explain a little bit why this deal is even happening in the first place? And is there any significance surrounding the timing of it? Well, yeah, and yeah. Uh, the Good. significance <laughs> is you have this <laughs> you have the seven Arab Emirates that make up their unit unity government that have never had a war with Israel. So making peace unlike the peace with Jordan and um, Egypt of the past decades is much easier. Number two, they want Israeli technology uh, in the high-tech areas uh, and in regards to COVID. Uh, number three, they are trying to diversify their investment portfolio. These countries are fabulously wealthy traders. They're not oil-driven, they're business-driven. And quite frankly, I think the biggest reason is the old adage that's been true in politics for centuries. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And as Iran becomes more intentionally belligerent uh, in the Gulf region and threatens the Gulf states, especially the Emirates, they're looking around for an ally. And who hates Iran more than any other country? Well, Israel and the UAE is probably close behind. Therefore, this is a friendship uh, well, based on necessity. Yeah, and, and we heard President Trump, you know, tout his involvement in this. How much of an impact did the Trump administration have in getting this deal done and signed? And I mean, did any of his predecessors ever try to do the same thing that he did? I don't think there's a possibility to overemphasize the significance of the deal Trump has pulled off. I literally put this in the category of Nobel Peace Prize nomination. This is a deal that is unprecedented for decades and it's all about Trump pushing both sides to get married. Mm -hmm. And I give him the credit for it. Keep in mind, every president since Clinton has been obligated by the Congress under law to move the embassy to Jerusalem and they all came up with cockamamie excuses as to why they weren't gonna do it. Every president since Truman has put on the agenda an Israeli-Arab peace deal. Trump has pulled off a mini miracle, and you can't give him enough credit for what he has accomplished. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly been a long time in the making, and like he's pointed out, there's still more he wants to accomplish. So he's not done with this only. I mean, there's plenty. We see Jared Kushner very heavily involved leading a lot of these talks. but. The other thing that comes uh, to mind when I think about this is just watching a lot of the mainstream media and the legacy channels out there, they, they didn't quite give the uh, the same amount of reporting, the same amount of airtime to this story as they've done to other things like the pandemic, um, the debacle with the, the Postal Service. And, you know, we, we've seen a lot of these stories coming out of the uh, the Middle East in particular, and they're big stories. Uh, I mean, there was the bombing or the explosion, I should say, in Lebanon, uh, the recent uh, developments with Iran and the Trump administration's request for the U.N. And you don't see a lot of this in the mainstream media. Why do you think that is? It's so simple and it's such a great question. You can't spin it negatively so you don't report on it. You cannot overemphasize the value of this deal and you can't make Trump look bad by uh, just telling the truth about the deal. So as you said, it just doesn't get reported. Why? Because you can't spin it negatively. And the mainstream media is running something like 92% stories on Trump negative 8% stories on Trump positive, and they fill up the positive stories in the first one minute of every news day, so the other 92% has to be bad. You have no room for this deal. So, mm -hmm. well, it's not reported. And, and, and the it's last, news. yeah, and in the last uh, minute or so that we have, I mean, aside from just not giving uh, people the information that they deserve and the transparency they deserve. What sort of larger impacts do you think that this this model of media has on communities, not just here in the U.S., but around the world? 
I, I was thinking back to my childhood. In my younger days, there were three sources of news. There was Walter Cronkite on CBS, Howard K. Smith on ABC, Huntley Brinkley on NBC, and they were fastidious about delivering the facts and letting you decide because you were intelligent enough to make your own decision. Now the news is you're kind of dumb. We need to tell you what it is. We need to tell you what to think. And don't worry, we'll give you a conclusion too. So the spin on the news is outlandishly biased to support the media bias at that specific source of, well, news. And I put news in quotes. The people that used to be part of it, for example, Dan Rather got fired for making up stories. So right. did Peter Jennings mm -hmm. uh, in the past. So now you have to be a very judicious consumer of news to figure out, well, what is really true and what is really spin? And it's hard to do. It's very hard to do, especially when you have such great news that mm -hmm. isn't even on the news. Right, right. And I mean, there's such a saturation to it. I don't blame people for not wanting to, to give the, the time or maybe not having the energy or, or the patience to dig through it, to find the truth and find the answers. Like you mentioned, there's there's just a lot happening and it could help us all if, if things were just a little bit more clear and a little bit more transparent and things got equal amount of attention. But Barry Newsbaum, thank you so much for coming on. Always a pleasure.